So how do you reduce inbreeding in a large flock, uh, say anywhere from 100 to up to 10,000 head of St. Cory sheep? What, what's the best way to get rid of inbreeding? Inbreeding can cause the spider lamb deformity in sheep uh, through inbreeding, and it can also cause the hip dysplasia that German shepherds had that's really ruined their German shepherd breed. Inbreeding destroyed the Habsburg royal dynasty in Austria and also led to the American Revolution as um, King George was so inbred that he, he was absolutely crazy. King Charles of uh, England and his brother uh, Prince Andrew both are inbred and so they, they have a lot of problems. Uh, they're, if, if they weren't royalty, they, they'd both be in jail at this point. That's the way I got it figured. And so when we see these obvious examples of inbreeding, like the Whitaker family and others, uh, that show on the outside, uh, it's, that's quite a bit of inbreeding to get there. But really, inbreeding, if, if you look at humans, it affects their traits first. That's why King Charles and Prince Andrew appear normal as they look on the outside, yet their traits are the, what's been affected by their own inbreeding. So if we apply this same logic to sheep, we know they don't have to look like a spider lamb to have lost their traits. And what are their traits? What would they lose through inbreeding? One would be um, their, their lack of um, parasite resistance. Uh, another would be their lack of overcoming different kinds of diseases, being disease resistant, uh, their, their flocking instincts, their ability to lamb without, without help, um, and, um, and, their, and their good mothering instincts. The loss of these instincts is being covered up by chemical dewormers, by various medications, uh, by helping the, the, them lamb when they, shouldn't, they can't lamb on their own, and by locking them up in, uh, in lambing pens so they have to bond with their own offspring. This lets those animals survive that really nature says shouldn't survive because nature calls all the mistakes that happen through natural inbreeding. So they've got a, a culling mechanism, but, but humans override that. Yet on the island of Soe, off the coast of Scotland, where the Vikings left these sheep for the last 1,000 years, they're not inbred because they've had no human interference with their genetics. So this isolated group of sheep, they're not inbred, yet the sheep that we raise commercially by the thousands, they are. So nature has a, a method uh, for stopping inbreeding, for preventing inbreeding, or if there is any inbreeding, it, it corrects the problem. And that's what we need to learn. We need to learn from nature. So a quick review of the scientific basis of inbreeding. Inbreeding is the production of offspring from individuals that are closely related genetically, uh, but it also refers to the genetic disorders and other consequences that may arise from the expression of bad recessive traits. Inbreeding results in homozygosity, which is where two bad places in the genetic code overlay each other. And, um, and so it's, it creates a, a better chance for, um, to, to affect the biological fitness of a population. It, it lowers it, and it's called inbreeding depression. And it affects the, uh, the ability of the, uh, the breed or the, uh, the organism to survive and reproduce. Wikipedia gave this example of the issue of casual breeders who inbreed irresponsibly and how it affects cattle. And so even though inbreeding increased the amount of milk produced by these cows, these cows became increasingly difficult to breed and they started having these higher health costs than cows of uh, lower genetic merit for production, which means the, the cows that weren't inbred. And so this intensive selection for a higher yield it increased relationships among animals within the breed and increased the rate of casual interbreeding. What that means is when you have a single ram that impregnates a lot of different females, uh, even though it may not be inbreeding at that point, later on down the line, these, these females even spread across different farms. They may have too much of the same genetic information. So that's what, that's what causes part of the problem. The article goes on to talk about how the U.S. dairy cattle population has become the most inbred it's ever been. And as a result of this inbreeding, the rate of increase in the U.S. national milk yield has tapered off. So now efforts are being made to identify desirable genes in cattle breeds not yet optimized or inbred by the U.S. dairy breeders in order to apply hybrid vigor and, and get the, the production back up. And here's, here's the reason 
cattle are having to be called, they're either having udder or mastitis problems, reproductive problems, or just poor production. And so um, a lot of that's because of all the inbreeding they're doing. And the same thing's happening in sheep. When you get um, a, a single ram that wins all these awards and you want to breed it a lot, uh, it, it's causing the inbreeding by using just a single ram when you shouldn't. You should be using a lot of different rams. One obvious way of inbreeding is called line breeding, where they breed the same, um, the same ram to its daughter, its granddaughter, and keep going until finally by the fourth generation, it's got 93.75% of their genes all from the same ram. And so that, that's caused a lot of your, your inbreeding problems. But there's another way that's a little bit more subtle. Now this technique is used by nearly every farmer, uh, every sheep shepherd, and um, it's probably the number one way that we cause inbreeding in the sheep breeds. Uh, ram C, uh, the male ram in the blue box at the top, is being mated to 12 different ewes, uh, from one, two, three, all the way over to BA3. So a St. Croix ewe will have on average 2.1 births, or, or about two, two births uh, per ewe, and on average, just for principles of uh, demonstration, we're gonna say each, each ewe gave birth to both a male and a female. So if these offspring were to mate, there's a chance that a brother and a sister could mate and that creates a very high coefficient of inbreeding. It's a brother-sister match of 25%. But if you have like 100 sheep or, or 10,000, you've got one chance in 100 or one chance of 10,000 of that happening. Uh, so that's really not what, what causes it. What's causing the inbreeding is that all of the ewes gave birth to lambs that are now half-siblings because they're all mated to the same uh, ram C up here at the top. And so now whoever they mate with, uh, they're going to mate with a half sibling, and that's a 12.5% coefficient of inbreeding, which is still very, very high. So by using a single ram, they're, they're going to cause these inbreeding problems. So to prevent inbreeding, we need to uh, replace uh, ram C with several new males uh, to add genetic diversity to the flock, and to try and bring the male to female ratio, ratio closer to one to one. So let's say we have uh, seven rams, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, they're being paired with seven ewes, one through seven. This will bring the, um, the male to female ratio right up to one to one. And, uh, and it really prevents all the inbreeding. And this is what you're gonna see in nature. And so these um, ewes and rams would produce offspring that are genetically distinct from each other. And while any brother-sister match would produce a coefficient of inbreeding of 25%, and a brother-sister match would be rare because if you got 100 ewes and 100 rams, it'd be one chance in 100 you would actually mate with your own sister. And so it's much more likely the, the lambs would mate with other lambs that are not related. And that would create a 0% a coefficient of inbreeding, at least for this generation. Now, there, you can go back some generations. I'm sure you'll find some inbreeding back there, but... At this generation level, it completely reduces the coefficient of inbreeding by bringing the male to female ratio up to one to one. Ronald Fisher was a geneticist who explained his Fisher's principle, which uh, it, it gives the reason why the, the sex ratio of most species uh, is approximately one to one between males and females. So nature's method of eliminating inbreeding is to bring the male to female ratio back up to one to one, and it does it automatically. Uh, and so we should look at nature and follow nature on this uh, because it's got a better solution than we do. Fisher's principle as a natural occurrence in nature explains to us why the soy sheep on the island of soy are not inbred, even though it's a small population. Um, it's because they have a one to one male to female ratio in nature which by itself prevents or it helps eliminate inbreeding. So how do we do this with our own sheep? How, how do we do this as a shepherd? Um, well, there's a very, very simple solution to bring that male-female ratio right back up. Almost every sheep breed, with the exception of the, the merino sheep, will breed based on photo period. What this means is that every year when the days begin to become shorter, uh, around July 15th of the year, uh, this will bring the, uh, the sheep back into a reproductive cycle. The ewes will come into estrus in July and start ovulating about the same time. And the rams will increase their testicular weight 
in their sperm production, all beginning about July of each year, all because the days are starting to shorten. So if we look at this calendar I made, a circular calendar, uh, we can see that in the fall from June 21st up to December 21st, uh, the days began to shorten. And so we, we see naturally that the lambs will be born starting December 15th through January 15th, and there'll be a few even in February and March, but the, the observed lambing season for St. Croix sheep and other sheep uh, begins about December to January. Since sheep have a five-month gestation period, this means that the, um, the, the uh, estrus cycle began July 15th to August 15th. That's really your, your peak breeding season. And then five months later, the, uh, the lambs are born. And then after the lambs are born, about another five, four or five months, the ewes will self-wean their lambs to get ready for the next breeding cycle. So that happens between May and June of the following year. So this gives us a window of uh, the end of June to remove all the ewes and rams that we see are unfit for, for breeding. Because we don't want these unfit uh, rams and ewes uh, to enter the next breeding cycle. We also know that all the breeding should have finished by October 15th. So after October 15th, we can begin removing the rams no longer needed for breeding. What this means is that all the rams that are born between December and January and then are weaned at four or five months old between May and June, we can leave in uh, for breeding. These young rams will bring, will bring the male to female ratio back up closer to one to one um, and they'll be sexually mature at seven months. So uh, that means they're perfect for, for breeding in the cycle. So the way nature has it, the gestation period or the time between the time the, the ram is conceived until the time it is born is five months. And then this same baby ram that's born can reach its own sexual maturity in seven months. This means a ram lamb can breed exactly 12 months after it was conceived which means it can participate in that next year's breeding session. So in this large flock, we keep the rams that were born December 15th to January 15th, we keep them all the way up until October 15th of that year uh, and let them participate in the breeding season. And this brings the, um, it brings the male to female ratio up much closer to one to one. So St. Croix sheep will have on average two offspring for every ewe. So 100 ewes will produce 200 lambs. And on average, there's gonna be 100 ewe lambs and 100 ram lambs. So at breeding time, you're gonna have 200 females and 100 males, which creates a sex ratio of two to one. Now with these 200 females and 100 males and a, a sex ratio of two to one, and if you had kept 50 males from the prior year, and these are males that are like a year and a half old, and uh, they're, the, they're the best males you've ever seen, and so you're keeping the very best males, the best 50 out of the 100 that are born each year. Well, now you would have 200 females and 150 males, and that would create a sex ratio of four to three, which is almost a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, no male should be kept more than two years because you don't want him breeding uh, that much with his own offspring. But just for one or two years with 100, 100 head of sheep, his chances of breeding his own family are, are very remote. And we've all seen what we consider to be the perfect male. He's good and strong. You want him to, to uh, reproduce in your herd, in your flock. Um, but really, after two years, you're taking a chance with inbreeding. Uh, the ewes can be kept as long as you want. But the males, they need to go after two years, and that's the problem with what they're doing right now. They get a single male that, that wins a lot of uh, these awards. They give them a pet name like Goliath or Godzilla the Magnificent, and, and, they, try and uh, they try and pass him around as much as they can to all the other places, and they make money off, off the way he looks. But they're only concerned with his observable traits. Uh, he has hidden traits, too, uh, uh, a, a genotype. But his phenotype, or the expressed traits, are all they can see. He also carries the traits of all the feminine offspring he might have, all the females. And uh, whether he has uh, the genetics for good lambing, uh, for, uh, for all the things, for good mothering, for, for making good milk, uh, you don't know because he's a male. 
That's why you want as many males as possible because you know when these uh, these bad genetics show up, you want to call them out. You don't know if there's in there that they may not be expressed in a single individual, but he still carries them. But when they are expressed, you can call about your herd, and the more you do that, the more you improve the genetics of your flock. So you, you call from the bottom and um, try and get rid of the, the obviously bad ones. Anyone can pick a, a bad animal. It's really hard to pick the very best animal because you can't see all the traits he has or what's being expressed. Well, I hope this gave you some good ideas, and uh, thank you for your comments.